Okay, I think we can start because I anticipate a lot of questions for Alex. The good questions, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> we are ready also for the bad one. Let me start off by first of all thanking Alex for doing this. This is absolutely wonderful. Alex is an old friend of ours. Myself, Stephen, Brian, we know Alex for a long time now, maybe 20, 25 years, something like this. But Alex is currently the Sternberg Family Distinguished University Professor at Northeastern University and the founding director of the Northeastern Network Science Institute. He received his bachelor's and PhD from University of Rome and completed his postdoctoral fellowship at Yale and Leiden University. His research focuses on data-driven computational modeling of epidemic and other spreading processes. And Alex has been honored by a number of different institutions and societies. Let me just say a few of them. He was elected as a fellow of the American Physical Society, the Network Science Society. He was a member of Academy of Europe. and a fellow of the Institute of Qualitative Social Science at Harvard. Recently, and I, uh, I think it's a big honor in our opinion for Alex, the Italian government has bestowed upon Alex the honor of the Knight of the Order of the Star of Italy. Hopefully I said it right, Alex. It's an amazing honor. It's the highest honor the Italian government gives to folks who have contributed and advanced the cooperation between Italy and other countries. Alex, You know, I know that you have done amazing work during this COVID-19 pandemic and people here are really eager to, to listen to your talk. Thank you very much again and we look forward to your talk. Well, first of all, thank you very much. It's really, I would say, it's a pleasure. As, as you said, Mara, I think uh, our relation and scientific exchanges uh, dates back at least 20, 25 years and it's a long time. <laughs> And, uh, and it's an honor also because of that. I, I really, when we say rhetorically, you know, in a way that science is made on the shoulder of the giant. And I have to be honest, the Madhav and Stephen and the BBI team uh, uh, were my heroes when I did start this work. I, I, I will mention later several of, of, of their uh, seminal contributions. But for me, really, they were heroes that have helped me to, to, to get into the field and introduced me to the excitement of working in this area. I will talk a little bit about what we did in terms of computational modeling and our uh, work for COVID-19, uh, both on, on, on the research side and, and as well on the response side. I will try to frame everything, however, in a way that we can get perhaps some uh, lessons and some learning for the future and more in general for the, for the research field. I really have to say that I... I Everything I will, uh, I, I will show you, it's because of a team effort. I had uh, the benefit of really fantastic collaborators. So a wonderful group at uh, Northeastern University that is working nonstop since, uh, since two years, uh, but as well, many, many collaborations across the US and Europe with contributions also from private companies uh, because of the data, also colleagues in China. And, and so I really, I'm, I'm grateful uh, uh, to all of them for these years of work. And then I should add many more names for basically a trajectory that started about 20 years ago. Uh, a little bit more specifically, our team uh, has been working in the area of multi-scale modeling of infectious diseases since uh, quite some time with a focus especially on the global uh, spread of infectious diseases. Uh, but, you know, especially now during the pandemic, we had to, I would say, to, to try to use all the, the, the possible weapons in our uh, armory and, and go at different levels. I, I will try to show you a bit of the examples. And we have been part of uh, the many groups that have been uh, providing uh, intelligence for this pandemic uh, for the Center for Disease Control, uh, the WHO. And, and here I've been in, in most of these meetings and calls uh, with all the friends uh, of the Institute. So that's another thanks uh, to all of you. So I let me start from one place uh, that is uh, data, because I think what we have been able to to do in, in these last uh, two years is mostly because of a background that has been built in the last 20 years, uh, and especially a, a background uh, of data uh, that were crucial also in this, this occasion, 
for COVID to get uh, an understanding of, uh, of the spreading of infectious diseases and more generally transmissible infectious diseases, uh, really changing uh, the way we approach the modeling of those systems uh, and moving from a more theoretical and research perspective really to a more actionable uh, way of working uh, and, and providing information about the diseases. And for sure, you know, we we talk about a lot in these days about phylogenetic, our understanding of viruses and and what we can get from uh, gene sequencing. But as well, you know, all the information that we get from mobility data, the fact that we benefit from uh, information technologies, from mobile devices, uh, in a way that uh, provides unprecedented uh, information on human movement and contacts that we use for infectious disease modeling. And then also, Actually, other areas like, for instance, census data and population data that have, have benefited from technologies like machine learning. You know, now nowadays maps, population maps are derived not just from, from census data, but from light emission captured by satellites mixed with census data, with machine learning and so on and so forth. And so this is really, it's a change of, of paradigm that also in the past years uh, benefited of other data sources, including uh, what we call novel digital data streams. And I'm talking about uh, Google searches, uh, Twitter communications, and, and, and many more. To a point that, you know, if you remember about 10, well, at this point, probably 12 years ago, there was a famous editorial on uh, Y Magazine uh, by one of the editors that, uh, that was called The End uh, of Theory. And in a sense, in a, in, in a nutshell, the, the piece was saying, OK, you know, we are able now and we will be able in the future to collect more and more data. We just need to feed those data into some artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm and we will get all the information response and answers we want. Although maybe we don't understand why we get that answers, but we don't care. And actually, the piece was closing with the sentence that uh, I think didn't uh, please many of the, 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 my colleagues as well as me, saying, you know, it's time that uh, science uh, learn from Google. So in, in a way, it was a bit extreme, but was a provocation that I think it was important and was then found this, its incarnation in, uh, uh, you remember the story of uh, Google Flu Trend, that was an important story, which, you know, well, the, the idea that is really a bright idea is to say, well, why we have to spend an immense amount of resources to get uh, sentinel doctors and data from outpatient hospital network, et cetera, to, to monitor the flu. All those data, by the way, are collected, have to be analyzed, et cetera. So we are always two weeks behind, in a sense. The data that we have now are always providing a picture of a couple of weeks old. While we can, for instance, sift through the millions of searches on Google, identify specific keywords and train machine intelligence with the, the historical data of the flu in order to actually get a real time now cast on, on the flu season and actually then using other techniques also quite good, uh, good forecast. Well, that was initially a success, but you know, the problem with, with machine learning is that there are a potential number of pitfalls that have to be considered. And that those goes from the lack of micro level understanding, a sort of famous black box effect, uh, all the intrinsic biases, issues related to the forecast in areas like uh, health uh, systems and uh, infectious diseases. The fact that, uh, you know, that we are constantly changing our approach to diseases, our healthcare system is changing, and more data is not necessarily better prediction or better, better understanding. Actually, you know, if you take data from 50 years ago to understand what's going on uh, with the flu, you actually cannot transpose those data in nowadays situations. And so there are also more uh, subtle issues of, of theoretical nature that are related to the Poincaré theorem, uh, low dimensional projection of high, di uh, high dimensional systems and so on and so forth. And so this is important to say that, you know, actually, it's really, it is important. And I consider Google flu trend a success, uh, although now it has discontinued uh, because of several hiccups, et cetera. First of all, because it 
open uh, infectious disease modeling, uh, public health to uh, a huge amount of signals and data that actually were not considered before. We learn also how to do better than just looking at, uh, you know, searches, but actually combining those data, combine those data also with, with standard public health data. So to really create uh, machine intelligence algorithm that works very, very uh, well. But at the same time, also, uh, you know, this, this opening has brought all the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning in, in public health. And we see that uh, here, for instance, with the, with the flu site initiative by the Center for Disease Control, well, many of the modeling approaches that are successful to predict the flu are indeed based on artificial intelligence, big data, and novel digital data streams. However, you know, we don't want to abandon the other historical way of modeling epidemiology. This is especially true for infectious diseases like COVID-19, where you have a new pathogen. First of all, initially, you have a really a lack of training data. Second, all the reporting is not established like for diseases that we know since 50 or 100 years. And so, you know, testing volume, capacity, catchment, uh, even the case definition of the disease are constantly changing. And so that's also very slippery for most of the machine intelligence approaches. Heterogeneous time lags, the fact that uh, such uh, scale for a pandemic are changes completely many of the proxies that we could use in those approaches, uh, pharmaceutical interventions, the way we use the web to, to search information, et cetera, et cetera. So why all these long preamble is because I think really we don't have to, to think of uh, computational epidemiology as something that is evolving in one direction or another. I think really what we need, and this pandemic has brought even more to, to the surface, is the fact that we want to have actionable modeling. And actionable modeling means modeling that we can use to make uh, decisions, to have uh, knowledge of the future, to optimize interventions. And they can come from many, many different data sources, big or small, and from the different approaches that could be mechanistic. And I will show what is our, for instance, our way of approaching infectious disease modeling that is very mechanistic, but can be also machine intelligence always keeping in mind that we need interpretability. So we want to go from a time series to something like modern meteorology, in which we understand we have effective equation. We can look into the effect of uh, uh, poor knowledge of initial conditions. Uh, what is really the confidence interval we have on, on our understanding of the disease trajectory and so on and so forth. Well, this is a path that uh, in our team we did start uh, from a background that was uh, mostly from physics and computer science, and it was based on, on the metaphor of reaction diffusion processes. And here is where I can tell you, this is basically why we say mechanistic process. So the, the, the idea is that, you know, individuals are like particles, and those particles are tagged by the disease stage of the individual, as well by other attributes that can be gender, uh, occupation, age, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All that uh, is, however, mapped into a very large network of locations and places at different scale where those individuals are. And those individuals in those places have close contact, might transmit the disease to other individuals, but then they have basically, they follow a diffusion process among locations. Well, this is what we call in physics reaction diffusion processes, but in, in the infectious disease perspective, you have to change this angle because the diffusion is not anymore a random process. This is informed by data. Is data driven? So you need to know where people go, how people commute, how people travel internationally, and so on and so forth. As well, you need to have uh, information on the disease uh, what we call the disease etiology, so all the, the various uh, stage of the disease, the transmissibility of the disease, the incubation time, and so on and so forth. All that is transferred in a mechanistic perspective into equations that uh, describe the, the disease transmission across individuals and across uh, locations. And those locations can be a different scale, it can be one city as a country or all, uh, a simple neighborhood. Here you see there is a simple example in which I use a very simple SIR model. This is a 
simulated through a chain binomial process in order to get the stochasticity and the discrete nature of individuals. But there are many other techniques that can be used to transform the transmission process in equations and then map it into the modeling of the diffusion of the disease that is carried by, by individuals across the across world. Well, we did start to build a platform, a computational approach that was multiscale, that was allowing us to go from the largest global geographical resolution down to the single level of urban areas or neighborhoods. And, and the idea is basically to have several layers that describe the population first with all the attributes that are of interest for a specific disease. On top of this layer, you use generally a description of, of uh, short-range mobility. This is commuting patterns, uh, all the things that we do on a daily scale. And then other layers could be different layers, but in general uh, is, uh, is another layer related to long-range transportation, that is airport network. In some countries, uh, it, also, also railways and, uh, and other transportation means, but generally th these are patterns that are large scale in terms of the, the distance and the time of, of travel. Well, at this point, you really can simulate uh, in a discrete way billions of individuals. And here is where also you find the bottleneck of computing times. And this is why you want to have, I would say, a modular structure that uh, allows you to, to get different resolution and adapt the mechanistic model for the disease transmission modeling at, uh, at different scales. And so you see, you have different geographical resolution that we can use, but at the same time, you can use different resolution for the description of the disease transmission from the homogeneous mixing models that might be enough to get an understanding of the global patterns uh, at the, the worldwide scale, then you can add age structure, you can use agent-based models, which are more, uh, more detailed for, for specific neighbors. And also we use uh, a lot, you know, and I, I, I will show you in a, in a couple of minutes why, uh, multi-layer networks that where the layers of the network are basically settings for transmissions and uh, the network on each layer represents the contact pattern that we observe in those places uh, from data. Well, all that has to be data-driven. And this is why a lot of effort during the peacetime is devoted by a team like mine and as well uh, the one of Stephen and Madhav to actually build those uh, synthetic populations and uh, information system that we need uh, to simulate the disease. Generally, what we use here uh, is, a, is a kind of uh, the general pipeline that we have. We start with micro census data that are very detailed at the single household level. From this single household level through bootstrap resampling and many other techniques, you generate the synthetic populations that respect other characteristic of the overall population at the macro scale, like the, the age structure, the, the household composition, and so on and so forth. And from this population modeling, where you also add information on the school, the workplace, uh, add random contacts uh, in the community, or if you have data on the connectivity of individuals in the community, as we can get in some cases from, from mobile devices, uh, you can have also that layer. You build uh, basically a synthetic population that is made of network of contacts uh, at different time scale, could be daily, could be weekly, and so on and so forth. It also, the time scale is based on, on the kind of disease you are, you are looking at. Well, in many cases, working at this scale is, uh, is, is an overkill for routine and actionable results. Uh, and so you have to use mesoscopic description. For instance, aggregate those network to generate mesoscopic description like classic age contact patterns in which you don't look anymore at the detailed patterns of each individual, but you say, if you are a 10-year-old individual, what is your probability to be in contact with somebody who is one year old, two years old, et cetera, et cetera. That is a kind of contact uh, network among individuals, but just age stratified that simplify a lot the kind of calculation you can do. And so you have to use different approaches depending on the questions you ask. On top of those synthetic population, you, you plug in your infection transmission model. And the infection transmission model 
we talk a lot about SIR and SIR, but actually, again, for to get something that is actionable, generally you end up in those crazy wiring diagrams where we have up to 100. I think the, the, the latest models that we use are 120 compartments where each individual goes through the different stages for different infections, different strains of, of COVID and so on and so forth. Well, why networks are so important in, in all this game? Well, because basically this is, at the end, whatever you do is that you generally you build a network, a network of individuals in their household then you associate them to workplace or schools. You generate basically bipartite network of individuals and places where they are. And through the unipartite projections or the layer projection of those, uh, those contacts, you create networks of contacts over which the disease spread. And this is really, uh, here I have to, to, to mention that this is work that has been pioneered by Madhav, by Stephen. It's, there is really a seminal paper in 2004 in which they put forward basically the science on how you go from data that we can collect about individuals and their whereabouts into a network construction that then we can use to simulate infectious disease at the scale of single individuals. Well, now this is uh, over the years has I've been uh, addressed and worked out by, by many, many other teams that have provided valuable contributions. And so, as I said, you can go into multi-layer networks. You can use multi-layer networks that changes in time. You can use different projections. So what is on the layer, it depends on, uh, on the interest and the kind of data that you have. In some cases could be settings, in other cases could be individuals of a given age and so on and so forth. And so all that basically, however, is now at the core of the methodology we use. And then there is another component of the network that is crucial, that is the location. So as I said, then we have to monitor and simulate how individuals goes from one place to another. And this is generally done through metapopulation networks. So networks where we have individuals within each location, we have a network like this one, that this multi-layer or, or complex network that we have. And then there is a network that connects different locations like New York, Seattle, San Francisco, and so on and so forth. And, and that network has a coupling that is generally described through the travel flows and the travel volume of individuals from one place to another. So this is the methodology. Now, what do you do with that? Well, First of all, I, I know that during the, the past two years, everybody was talking about forecast, but this is something else that we did try to stress a lot of times, also with Stephen and Eubank in a commentary that was in PNS at the time of Ebola. So it's actually, modeling is much more than forecast. Modeling is allows you to understand infectious disease uh, spreading at the, in many, many different ways. The first one is situational awareness, uh, there is intervention planning, scenario analysis, parameter estimates, epidemiological explanation, so many, many things. Here I'm just showing, for instance, some of the work that I've done during this, the past two years, and, and they goes from understanding the transmission heterogeneities of uh, SARS-CoV-2 spreading to the effect of eviction moratoria on the epidemic, estimating the effect of uh, actually development index and, and basically the wellness of neighborhood in, in the impact of COVID-19 due to the different way of, of uh, adherence to, to the restrictions and the different kind of workers that you have in different areas through uh, travel restriction and so on and so forth. So now let me, you know, the question that I'm getting asked often in, in, in recent times is, okay, but really what, what did you do? Because now if you go on the media, there is a lot of criticism about models and okay, Nobody ever understood anything about COVID. Everything was a question mark. But actually, if we go through the history of the, the past two years, actually model and algorithms did really a lot for our understanding and response to, to the pandemic. Let me start from the very simple things done in January 2020. So when in China, the world authorities were reporting just a handful of cases and then at a certain point they, they we were in not even in the hundreds of cases the situation were very foggy the questions were basic there is human to human transmission or not what is the actual magnitude of the outbreak over there it's really 
20, 50, 100 cases, or is something uh, that, that is just the tip of the iceberg? Well, this is something that the models uh, and, and the modeling approaches provided some answer right away. Because, you know, if you have uh, good data on traveling patterns from the specific epicenter of, of an epidemic, and then you start to get detection of cases across the world. In this case, in early, in mid-January, we had the first two detection of COVID uh, cases in Thailand and one detection in Japan. From that moment, you can start to do the reverse engineering and say, well, if I have those uh, traveling flows from uh, the epicenter in China to those locations, what is the probability that I have uh, an outbreak of 10 cases, 1,000 cases, uh, 10,000 cases, et cetera, given the fact that I have those two cases observed in Thailand and one in Japan. And then you can continue to do that as more cases you observe in time. So this is not even a, a, a mechanistic model. It's really just a, a back of the envelope calculation, not that back of the envelope. You can do simulations, you can do Bayesian approaches, but at the end, what you get is a posterior distribution for the number of cases that you estimate are in China if you have those cases observed internationally. Well, mid-January, models were already telling that the cases were in the tens of thousands in China. And that were, was raising flags all over the places and was pointing out that there was human-to-human -human transmission, very difficult to imagine as you know, uh, something that is not human-to-human -human transmissible and generate uh, 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 tens of thousands of cases and so on and so forth. And that was just to give you one contribution to, uh, to the situational awareness, to our understanding of the disease. Well, then you can start to model, uh, you know, you get more information and then you start to model what is the evolution? For instance, what is the importation probability of individuals? The, he, here is where you need really computational power. And uh, uh, this is like a little bit the picture that you use for weather forecast. You have a lot of modeling assumptions, especially at the beginning when you don't know that much about the model. And then you have priors on your parameters. And then you have your stochastic evolution in the models. And so you generate thousands and thousands of trajectory. You try to calibrate those trajectory by throwing away what you know is really not, uh, not compatible with the empirical observations, with the evidence. But then you are left with a lot of uh, compatible trajectory that... Uh, provides you, you know, a statistical analysis, a credible interval for various measures of what you project in, in the future. And those probabilistic information is where what you use to start analyzing what would be the evolution and trajectory of the epidemic. And this is what, for instance, our team did start uh, in, in January to understand, for instance, what was the benefit of travel restrictions. So if you do a travel ban in one and then a, then we do travel restriction to China. What is the benefit of it? Well, there is a benefit because actually you delay the arrival of many cases. You have border screening, control, etc. You don't import as many cases. But this is just a delay because, first of all, you need to have local uh, mitigation measures. Otherwise, the cases become so many that you have you have dispersion anyway but then it also depends on when you have set up those travel restrictions unfortunately the travel restriction did start when there was already a large dispersion of cases a few hundreds from many places and so you see for instance what what happens in this chasing of an epidemic by doing travel restriction Initially, you know, most of the contribution of cases to the various places were coming from one. When there was the travel ban in one, however, the other places started to be contributors to importation in, uh, internationally. So these are other places in China. Then you do travel restriction to China. And unfortunately, you realize that you had already dispersed uh, cases uh, uh, across the world. And those cases are creating infections that are then generating and uh, silently spreading across the world. This is typical of diseases that have uh, asymptomatic and asymptomatic cases. So a lot of infections are not observed, are not captured by the, the healthcare system unless you do testing. And at that moment, if you remember, we didn't have testing. And the model uh, were very useful to try to get, uh, you know, what is what can we understand about the cryptic uh, 
evolution of the disease. So that stage of the disease in which you know there is transmission is just you are not capturing it. And here I'm measuring what, what we did at that time. And these are cases in Europe and United States on the top panel. You see, it's a few tens of cases that were identified. But actually, if you do any modeling, you realize that you had actually thousands of transmission per day in Europe and thousands of transmission per day by the end of February in the US. That explains then well why at certain point when the tip of the iceberg start to surface, you get immediately a large number of deaths. It's not that you have generated infection uh, all in, in, in a couple of days, but actually, you know, the epidemic was brewing for several weeks. At the same time, you can also look at here on the right of your screen to the probability of having more than, uh, I think, 10 or 50, I think this is 10 uh, transmissions per, per day. And, and you see that, you know, you can call a pandemic because at a certain point, the probability at the end of, of, of February, March, that you have ongoing local transmission in most of the countries was approaching basically certain outcome. And this was a way that models were flagging the, the onset of, of a pandemic. This is, for instance, what the modeling approaches were, were saying, our global modeling approaches. You see the onset of a local transmission in different states in the US. Obviously, there is differences. And you go from California, New York, Florida, that were the first states that imported cases and dead local transmission to states like South Dakota, etc., that are less internationally connected and have a shift in the onset of local transmission. The same occurred in, in Europe. It's also interesting to see how we do this kind of ritual merry chase by doing travel targeted travel restrictions. China was a contributor only at the very beginning of the epidemic. Then you do travel restriction, and you see that contribution are coming from Europe and Asia. But then, you know, you start to do travel restriction. But you, you look in most of the United States and Europe, the injection and introduction of, of cases was domestic from Europe itself or United States itself. That's because you start to have outbreaks, and those outbreaks are silently spreading uh, across the countries. Well, then you can use models uh, to look at what is the impact of, the, of the, the, the epidemic, to evaluate the deaths, and try to get a picture of what, what was going on in different countries, why different uh, interventions might give rise to, 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 to very different uh, attack rate and different evolution of the epidemic. You see here, for instance, uh, look at Europe. You have countries that have been really almost not affected by the first wave, down to countries with really a very large number of, of cases. And these can be estimated by, by looking at the interventions that you can plug in the model and then basically uh, contrast with data that you have from, for instance, from serology and, and other sources. I just want to mention, uh, however, now what we do when we get into the scenarios and forecasts. And this is work that we have done with uh, really in the last two years with a lot of colleagues. Uh, and I think really we need to, to, to change uh, the, the paradigm of, of how we, we work in, 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 in this area. Uh, but anyway, it's important to distinguish two things. Uh, forecasts, which are short term at the most four weeks uh, analysis, and projections, which are on a much longer term, and based on scenarios where you do strong assumptions on what will happen in the future on a long time scale. So naturally forecast you can probably hope to have some uh, resemblance and you want to capture the trajectory of the epidemic in the next two or three, four weeks. In the scenario analysis, you can't expect those results. Uh, any of the assumption will not realize in the future in the same way that you have assumed it. And so you can't expect those to be forecast and to be realistic. They can be an envelope. They can give you an idea of what will happen in, in the next months and, and especially evaluate interventions and different scenarios, but you don't have to consider them as forecast. I think here there was endless uh, communication uh, uh, mistakes that also we as modelers, we did in, in the past uh, two months. So... Uh, I think this is very easy to communicate to you that scenario analysis is not forecast uh, and that the worst case scenario is not forecast by definition because for sure we will do something that will change the projection of the worst case scenario unless the 
worst case scenario is so benign that nobody cares and uh, and so on and so forth all these are things that have i think plagued the communication and the debate uh, of uh, pandemic interventions and 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 numerical and the numerical works we were doing uh, if we go to forecast here i i want to stress uh, that forecast is really a huge numerical effort because forecast uh, have to assimilate the most possible and timely way a lot of real world data that goes from changes in contact matrices, different interventions, school closures, lockdowns, uh, uh, changes to the priors, uh, to our knowledge of parameters in the model, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All that uh, impose uh, rerunning those simulations every week. And this is something that is generally time consuming, uh, costly, and require, in many cases, supercomputing if you want to use that uh, uh, large scale mechanistic models. And so that's why I, I say that this is one of the major efforts for mechanistic models. There are models that are machine intelligence based that indeed perform very well and requires, in a sense, a little less uh, intense computing. The other things that we need is data. So a large effort that has been done in, during the pandemic in the past few months is to work with data providers. For instance, this is our uh, work we did with Cubic, it's an intelligence location provider, uh, to map uh, changes in mobility, contact patterns among individuals in a way that we can integrate in real time in, in the models. Also, those data have been produced by Facebook, by Google, uh, by many other digital uh, giants, in a sense. And I hope that we will be able to, to really transfer the, the, the lesson learned during the past two years to help the control of infectious uh, uh, diseases in the future. This is really a large part of the work that many modeling teams uh, did beside, beside the modeling uh, effort itself. And here, just to give you an idea, you do very large scale simulations and uh, you calibrate the model for a very long time. And then you just get those four weeks uh, in advance projections. So you see that this is uh, why we have to repeat those every week. And, and, and the short term predictions and forecasts are really uh, an exercise that, that is quite intensive and requires uh, a lot of human resources and, and computing resources. However, here I just spent the last five minutes of this talk to bring a couple of major issues is that models are just models. And we have always stressed these uh, as models. Results vary from model to model. There is no perfect model. We uh, drop this uh, quest for the Uber models uh, 25 years ago. Actually, what we want to have is a portfolio of models with different, different assumptions, different approaches and methodologies so that we can combine them in a better way. This is another pioneering work where Stephen uh, Eubank team has participated, uh, I think at this point, what was uh, 15 or 17 years ago, it was on, on, a, on a very famous paper on PNS. That for the first time, they did a multimodal assessment of uh, uh, pandemic uh, scenarios, because this is where we have to go. And, and just, I, I was tweeting about that uh, yesterday. This is the weather forecast for the next three days. I'm talking about now, today, for Boston. We are going to have one of these bomb cyclone hitting us on Saturday. And here you see the two most established models in meteorology. One is the European forecast model, and the other one is the American forecast model. You see that those two models provide the same picture. There will be a major northeastern winter storm hitting the Northeast coast. But if you look at the snow projections, in places like New York and then the South part, you get differences of 20 to 30 inches. So these are huge differences. And you would say then, are models useless then? Because what they do in New York? Do I start to, to get extra resources for snow removal or not? That those two models you know, provide a very different picture. And do we act on this information? How do we weigh the risk assessment? Well, this is something that in meteorology, indeed, there is a lot of methodologies that are all based on multimodal forecast. 
when you have a tropical storms, a winter storm, etc., you see those patterns and then you provide projection to places with confidence intervals that actually are the aggregation of many different models. And some of those models have patterns that are very, very different from, from the consensus, but you plug those in. And it's not that always the best model is the best. And that's why you, you have to consider multi-model forecast. Well, this is an example where we have been working a lot also with Madhav, Stephen and their teams. So in, in the past two years, to try to create multi-models approaches, there were two initiatives. One is led by, by Nick Reich at UMass and collaboration with, uh, with the CDC. Another one is the Scenario Modeling Hub, another coordination teams with Cecil Board, Justin Lesser, Katrina Shi, et cetera, many, many other people. And, 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 you know, the idea is not to base our forecast or scenarios on a single model, but actually on a multi-model exercise where you get envelope and, and ensemble from this model that, in a sense, are more robust, more reliable, even if uh, they provide also better awareness of what is the confidence interval, because models, uh, single models tend to, in a sense, always to uh, underestimate what is the uncertainty because it's they look at their own uncertainty and not the fact that you might have uncertainty just generated by the, the, the model approach or a certain specific assumption. And this is also has been used indeed by the Center for Disease Control for the short-term for forecast, where we have you know, several models every week compiling their forecasts that then are aggregated by ensemble techniques in order to produce ensemble projections that are actionable. This is, I think, is extremely important because I think really we need to get into a mature stage of our field, in which we are not have single modelers or modeling teams going out and putting forward their projections, their prediction, uh, advocating for this or that. We really need to have a center for, like center for weather forecast, a center for infectious disease modeling and uh, analytics uh, that uh, answer to the call of policymakers, where you have a constant dialogue with the policymakers and where academics and research teams develop new tools and contribute to the armory that, that can, improve, uh, can improve forecasting science. And here, I think there are still a lot of open challenges. And first of all, really, I, I just want this to, to, to scratch the surface of the fact that we still have a lot of foundational question on how we construct meaningful representative statistical synthetic population how we integrate heterogeneous data sets and heterogeneous scale, uh, time and, and space scales. Uh, definition of basic epidemiological quantities, even they changes in models if they are network or not. And, and often there is even confusion on, on language. And, uh, you know, the very definition of a reproductive number is different in a, in a network than in a metropopulation network or in a homogeneous assumption. So we really, there are still a lot of things we need to understand. Modeling behavioral adaptation is one of the major challenge that we have. We, we try to go around this problem by using data that are the most updated uh, that we can find, but we really need to have also a grip on possible behavioral predictions and, and, uh, and analysis. And then also there is an area that I think we're really we, uh, we have uh, a lot to explore, uh, and this is the combination of artificial intelligence and mechanistic model. We are trying to experiment in this area, and we see really that, uh, you know, that the artificial intelligence is good at providing things that mechanistic models cannot provide you in forecast, like uh, uncertainties that is due to the reporting system, to other idiosyncrasies in the data collections that the mechanistic model do not integrate while the artificial intelligence is able to find those patterns that are not actually are not transparent to us. And so the combination of them, it's really important. And I just want to close on this slide because the, it's important to keep the distinction between the wartime. That is what, in a sense, we are still into at the moment in which we do our best work and try to scramble to provide intelligence and analysis, and but then there will be peacetime in which really we need to build for the future, both the research and the infrastructure. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Alex. And it was a wonderful talk, not just because of the name dropping, but also yeah. because of the <laughs> questions that you raised for us to think about.
I'm going to take my prerogative as, as chair to ask you one that I'm that's close to my heart right now, which is what can we do about this immediate political knee jerk reaction of travel bans that persist for some predefined length of time, regardless of what the circumstances are? How do you think modeling can contribute to? I, I don't know. We did uh, a lot of uh, work with, with the agencies for travel bans. And I think, uh, let me say, there are a few. We all start, did start uh, talking about that on uh, before COVID-19, saying, you know, really, travel bans are not useful. I think there is a little bit more nuanced perspective now. In a sense, uh, for a pandemic, uh, a certain kind of travel restriction might help to buy you time. And this time in certain situations might be crucial. I think uh, initially the travel bans to China both time to many countries that unfortunately has been completely dissipated by not testing and not looking at what was the situation on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. So in a sense, uh, uh, we don't have to be always yes or no. I think, uh, anyway, targeted travel restriction, uh, especially for diseases with asymptomatic and low symptomatic cases, is, is problematic. Uh, it's, you don't, you know, you do the travel ban with China, while the, 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 you should, uh, you are always late. You are in a merry chase with the country that, that actually will be the next one to introduce cases in, in your uh, country. There are also, I think, travel bans have to be discussed with respect to the overall strategy of mitigation. Because if you decide for something like uh, New Zealand, uh, Hong Kong, uh, or, uh, or Australia, in which they went for a COVID zero policy, well, then you, you do the travel restriction. You, in a sense, you seal the country. And that's, that's, <laughs> that's a different strategy, which you say, well, if nobody enters, I can really hope to, 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 to keep the disease out. If you don't do these policies, it, I think travel bans should can be discussed in a temporary way to, to, to buy you, you some, some time. But we go always into this discussion every time, Stephen. And, uh, and I think the last time with Omicron, it was clear after one day that the travel bans were, in a sense, uh, toward the South Africa were completely not, how to say, worth. There were already full load of cases in, uh, in Europe, etc. So I think we need to learn more. We need to have a playbook. We need to have earlier detection of uh, strains and uh, new pathogens. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, and uh, this is the discussion, the, the, the travel ban is always politically very effective. It sends a message. We are doing something. And, and, and that is something that is very difficult uh, for any government not to, to do as a, as a step at any moment in time. So, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Excellent talk. Thank you so much. So the question for you is that, you know, the difference between, say, weather forecasting and, and epidemiological forecasting is that there's sort of a sense of a measurement of the outcome that is very definite for weather. You know if there was 20 inches that fell on New York or not, and you can tell which model really worked out. This last slide that you have, which is this idea that you might have situations where you can't even tell what happened with COVID, for instance, because of reporting, because of you know testing variations, etc. And this has been the challenge with epidemiological modeling. I think what has been easier for us to do, to be honest, is to be able to do a more regular epidemiology, look at secondary attack rates, look at case fatality rates for that it's been a little easier to see predictors of mortality and so forth. But I have wondered for a while what the value is of the forward projections of cases and deaths when both are measured so poorly are subject to political biases. I mean, the government cannot fudge the amount of snow that falls in New York, but they totally fudge the number of deaths. And therefore I question the value of why we put in the effort to do this at all in the first place. Thank you. Well, I think we have to operate on a good faith assumption and thinking that uh, there is not really cheating on numbers. Numbers might be affected by underreporting, problems in reporting, et cetera, et cetera. We have experiencing all the possible problems with both cases and deaths uh, in most of the countries, actually. But I think it's different than, than we have to assume uh, that, in a sense, they are still 
a representation of, of the reality. And so we try to evaluate forecasts, at least the short-term forecast on those numbers. I agree that in some cases, really, you do not know if you are really forecasting exactly the epidemic trajectory or the problems in reporting. This happens, for instance, during the Christmas break, what we are doing is to, to try to forecast, <laughs> you know, the delay of each health state in, in reporting their, their deaths. But there is something that, that you can learn. There are also better measures. For instance, we have seen that uh, hospital uh, admissions uh, have been more consistent numbers uh, in the past uh, several months. So we need also to make an effort to improve those numbers. In a sense, uh, weather forecast improved uh, also because we have better measures of the inches of snow. It's not trivial. Initially, you might have people going around and, and measuring in a bad way what, how many inches of snow has, has fallen. But once you have, you know, radar systems, you have satellites, etc., then you have better data. I think both areas have to move at the same time. So we need to have better models and we need also to have better surveillance systems that will produce better data. So if we move both areas, then, then we can imagine a much brighter future for, for forecast. Given say that, uh, in the example that I put that on the weather forecast, really, if you look at the two models, uh, that would be very difficult to act upon those models. In New York City and, 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 and the area more uh, in the south of the 95 corridor. So, however, what you do is that you have a picture emerging. You know that there is a blizzard. You know that there will be snow. You know that in a certain region, it will be very, very high. And if I look at what models have done, it's very similar. So we knew that certain states were more affected. That we knew that the, the, the pandemic was coming, that the numbers were very high for sure in certain places, and so on and so forth. So we need to, to not just criticize things like, oh, we cannot act wrong. You know, we have been doing that in weather forecast uh, for, for a long time. There is a long path of uh, improvements, but I think we, we can do that. And that's, that at least is my, my, my hope. Why I, I, I find also exciting this field in a sense for, from a research perspective, because there is so much improvement that can be done in the next few years. The second corollary to that, if I may, is that the big difference between, say, a weather thing where it's all completely exogenous, we can't control the amount of snow in New York but by doing something, is that much of epidemiology and what happens is a function of behavior. And behavior, individual behavior particularly, is very, very hard to predict, which is why many of these models often go wrong, because people respond to information by, you know, staying indoors or they mask, or in the case of HIV, they would wear more condoms or, you know, whatever it is. And I feel like, you know, this has been a big gap in both, as Dr. Francis Collins said while leaving NIH, he said, if I wish I had taken the time to understand why people take vaccines, and spent a little more time on that compared to just developing vaccines. And I think that's a huge, huge gap in computational epi and epi in general that we just don't take human behavior into adequate consideration. I'm not saying we don't do it at all. Obviously, you know, many people do. But I think this is really a I, I totally, I totally agree on that. It's, I can just say that, uh, you know, the, there is an area that we call behavioral epidemiology in a sense, uh, and behavioral infectious disease modeling. I, I think we have to do much more there. We need to identify the right data set. We need to work with data providers because actually we need those data that are difficult to, to collect. We need, in a sense, to build those, uh, those satellites that provide us the information to, 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 to work with. Uh, there is really a lot of work that has to be done. It's also, in a sense, is what gives us these four weeks uh, or two weeks or three weeks, uh, you know, time horizon. It's not, uh, while for weather forecast is the chaotic nature of the equations uh, in epidemiology, is not the chaotic uh, nature of the equations. Uh, is really the fact that on the time scale of two to three weeks, uh, behavioral changes are not, generally are not from day to night. So that's why then you, you can work for weeks, uh, uh, up to four weeks, and then forecast that becomes scenario, which you do assumptions of what, what will happen. But I think uh, scenarios are important too. The, the point is that many modeling teams and many communicators didn't stress enough that those scenarios didn't have just assumptions on the disease. They had assumptions on the policies. They had assumptions on the behavior of people. And, and we need to communicate that more clearly. 
in epidemiology, what we have in epidemic modeling is that the fact is that any scenario that will tell you that something bad is going to happen will not realize uh, mostly because we will do something to make not happen in that, uh, at, at least to, to that level. And so in a sense, uh, every scenario has a self-fulfilled prophecy that is not going to be as we see. And that's also something else that has to be conveniently and methodologically communicated. But that doesn't mean that it's not useful in the reasoning and the, and the use in the decision-making process. But I agree completely with you. This is, I think, is where the big investment and the use of social scientists uh, in embedding social scientists in the teams, uh, all that has to be done in the next generation of, uh, of modeling and research. Thank you again. And I hope you know that you've you're talking to a group that can really appreciate the amount of effort that's gone into what you've shown in this talk. I, I, I know your pain as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we look forward to hearing more from you over the, over the coming years. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a really a great pleasure to see you all. And thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Alex. Bye.